This pilot is about to take off from a small airport in New Hampshire. He flew Army observation planes and completed T-38 training in the Air Force. As a civilian, he was an accomplished instructor and check airman for a large airline. He actually received awards for superior airmanship based on his handling of an emergency. People who knew him at the time noted he was sharp and perceptive. He was active in his local community, so a wide variety of people can attest to this behavior. So he's had aerobatic and emergency experience. He's an experienced instructor. He's not coming off his game in old age. He's as accomplished and proficient and capable as anyone who could be watching this video. It's these very qualifications that make this accident scenario hard to watch and even harder to understand. Let's get into an airplane and let's see what it was like. My name's John, I have some planes. Let's fly that crash. This pilot was ending a career most of us would aspire to have. So it's probably more productive to think about how we would wind up making the same mistakes as he did than just to point out the errors and move on. Any single flight is a series of perceptions and corrections. Uh, a Colonel Boyd in the US Air Force narrowed this down to something called the OODA loop. Observe, orient, decide, and act. You have to observe something to know that it's worth considering. You have to orient yourself relative to it, which is a fancy of saying you have to understand how it's relevant. You have to decide on a course of action, and then you have to act on that course of action. You have to execute, and then you repeat this. So if we're flying an airplane, we have to know if we're high, low, fast, or slow, and then we make a series of corrections to guide our airplane down to land successfully. Observers saw the pilot's hand on the glare shield while the plane was departing the fuel pumps. Based on these observations, the NTSB determined some flight instruction may have been occurring. We care because this affects reaction times, and this is going to be a key part of reenacting the accident sequence. On a normal flight, a pilot or crew can detect a change, analyze the situation, and act. During instruction, there's some extra pieces to get through. The instructor has to decide whether he, the student will or will not benefit from handling the new situation. He has to appropriately scale prompting or intervention to achieve educational goals, and he has to accurately weigh the risks against rewards. The second striking factor from the NTSB report is the presence of diphenhydramine in the pilot's blood. That's the active ingredient in Benadryl. I don't think many of us would consider flying after popping a Benadryl or a Unisom. That's not reasonable. But ibuprofen was also detected in the pilot's blood. Mixes of ibuprofen and diphenhydramine are sold as Advil and Motrin PM. It's entirely understandable to think you're taking a Motrin when you accidentally grab a bottle that says Motrin PM. As reasonable as this sounds, there's more. Advertisements for medications like Advil PM and similar meds lead us to believe that if we take one of these medications at night to relieve pain before bed, we'll wake up ready to go and be active in the morning. For most of us, this is true. But according to the National Institute of Health and the Journal of Clinical Pharmacology, this may not be true as we age. The serum half-life of diphenhydramine in working age adults is about six to nine hours depending on age. However, for people age 70, the half-life of the serum increases to more than 13 hours. At the time of the accident, the pilot was 77 years old. The accident pilot didn't survive to tell his story. I'm speculating about potential errors with drugs. The thing I want to come back to is just how reasonable these errors are. As an instructor myself, I wouldn't think much about supervising somebody on their first flight at a fly-in. I certainly could see myself expecting to sleep off an Advil PM and simply thinking I need an extra cup of coffee in the morning. So the factors cited by the NTSB are factors which could have gotten any of this. So as we crawl into the plane to recreate this event, I want you, the viewer, to pretend you're a seasoned instructor giving a lesson to a student. When I first set about recreating this flight, I took the cup up to a safe altitude and tried to duplicate a high power, low speed scenario typical of student pilots. I pitched the plane up and stopped using coordinating rudder just before the stall. Simulating regression and habits, I used aileron to keep the wings level, and predictably, that created a left-hand turn. As that left-hand turn developed, adverse yaw from the aileron pulls the airplane into an incipient spin. By leaving the power in, sometimes enough elevator authority is maintained to get the AOA high enough to reach roll anomalies. This isn't what we see the accident plane do, however. I'm missing something. Rather than crisply under a spin, we see the airplane stall and then have a wing drop that it seems like the pilots are unable to recover from. Instead, I tried using coordinating rudder throughout a stall with a slight left turn introduced. I found that this did duplicate what we see in the mishap footage pretty well. We maintain coordination, more or less, until we're simply out of rudder travel, and then adverse yaw overcomes our control authority. At these higher angles of attack, despite washout and planform effects, 
The roll authority of the ailerons is nil or even slightly negative. We're never going to know what happened on this accident flight because the people that went through it didn't survive. There's no cockpit voice recorder, there's no flight data recorder. However, from the flight testing that we've done, I think it's pretty likely that the instructor pilot was probably on the rudders through the whole takeoff and accident sequence. And this makes sense. If you're giving someone their first flight and their first time taking off an airplane, especially on a Cessna 180 tail dragger, it wouldn't be unusual for the instructor pilot to be, if not on the rudders, at least ready to assist early. The stall warning horn must have been going off almost the whole duration of flight. So you, we would wonder why didn't the pilots recover almost immediately as soon as they were flying. The problem is we get used to flying with the stall warning horn going off. For example, during soft field operations, we're used to hearing it. And flying with a stall warning horn going off is not inherently wrong. If you're competing in stall events, for example, you'll get used to flying below published approach speeds, sacrificing gust margin for uh, short tail ending distances by flying with the stall warning horn going off. So we're going to fly the airplane near its critical angle of attack. We should probably talk about what we expect the airplane to do, and talk about ways that the airplane might do things we don't expect it to do. As we increase the angle of attack, we generate more lift and we create more downwash. So even though we're at a higher angle of attack, the air is still hitting the horizontal stabilizer more or less top to bottom. When we stall, however, we separate airflow from the top of the wing. Turbulent air is behind the wing and we no longer create that downward flow behind the wing. And now air hits the bottom of the horizontal stabilizer, causing the nose to pitch down. This is what we typically feel as a break in the stall. So that's how we keep the stalls predictable in pitch. To keep the stalls predictable in roll, we just make it so the wing stalls at the wing root before it stalls at the wing tip. This way we preserve aileron authority. And we do this by twisting the wing, that's called washout, uh, the shape of the wing itself, called plan form effects, and through things like stall strips, etc. Here's a video of a stall test being done. When you see the tufts of yarn start moving around in bumpy, turbulent flow, that's where that part of the wing is stalled. Note the progression of the tufts from root to tip. The airplane's propeller accelerates the airflow behind it. It is, after all, just a big fan. So we'll use red arrows to represent the faster air being blown behind the propeller. As the total angle of attack increases, the faster air behind the propeller makes it so sections of the wing affected by prop wash see less change in angle of attack on sections of the wing that aren't affected by prop wash. Also, fast air is still blowing over the airplane's tail, so rudder and elevator authority is more effective. As we move the total angle of attack to critical, stalling angle of attack, the outboard sections of the wing meet critical angle of attack before the inboard sections of the wing. This is especially true with takeoff flap configurations at takeoff power. That fast air moving over our tail also preserves elevator authority so we're able to get to higher angles of attack than we otherwise would be able to. This means that the stall is more prone to drop off, off on a wing, aileron authority is worse, and the stall break, if it comes at all, will come much later. On that note of roll control, we should talk about pilot psychology. Hardwired into the reptile part of our brain is the idea that if we move the yoke or control stick to the right, the airplane will roll to the right. So at normal angles of attack, we'll call these subcritical angles of attack. If we move the control stick to the right, the aileron on the right side of the airplane goes up and the aileron on the left side of the airplane goes down. The aileron on the right side of the airplane causes that part of the wing to have a lower angle of attack, generate less lift, and make less drag, whereas the downward aileron generates a higher angle of attack on that section of wing more lift, and more drag, creating a rolling moment and an adverse yaw moment. High power, we can defeat wing washout, and we have enough elevator authority not just to go to our critical angle of attack, but we can even go to super critical angle of attacks. This is even more possible if we're doing this at high power in a takeoff configuration. What sort of roll control do we have at these super critical angles of attack? So if we use power or sometimes rotational inertia around the pitch axis to go beyond the critical angle of attack, our roll control actually deteriorates to a point where it's ineffective and even reverses. So at high angles of attack, if we move the stick to the right, the right aileron goes up, the left aileron goes down. The right aileron sees a lower angle of attack, but this makes us less stalled, so it makes more lift and less drag and the downward aileron becomes more stalled, so it makes less lift and a whole lot more drag. Sometimes these drag couples can exceed our rudder authority, and sometimes the rolls are against the control input direction. So when we come back to this accident, we see a cocktail of factors. 
All of them are centered on slowing and skewing the pilot's OODA lead. The pilot was expecting medication to clear his body overnight, but instead he's still under the effects without knowing it. Control of the airplane is split between the instructor and the student. This degrades the tactile information the pilot's receiving. The pilot is an experienced aviator and a highly experienced instructor. He's flying a familiar aircraft, so it's less likely that he's going to react dramatically when a student inadvertently sets off the stall warning. We will never know when a transfer of control from the student back to the instructor occurred, and we're never going to know how cleanly and efficiently that transfer of control was conducted. We do know that an abrupt power reduction took place. I believe it's highly likely that a transfer of controls did occur, and the pilot and instructor was trying to save the airplane all the way to the moment of impact. I hope we've done these men and their memories justice. The things that got them were insidious. They weren't obvious. I think a lot of us are more vulnerable than we expect. If you catch yourself in a spot where the ailerons just simply aren't doing what they're supposed to, and perhaps you're at a low airspeed, high angle of attack situation, just ease the stick forward a little bit. Ailerons return to normal almost instantly. We need to decide that we're either providing an airplane ride or we're providing flight training. We don't want to switch between the two on the fly. This isn't to keep up with some formality, it's to force us to self-brief ourselves as instructors before we take our students into whatever situation they're gonna generate. The biggest thing I take from this event is a healthy respect for my ability to get it wrong and to be surprised by curveballs. I hope you enjoyed watching this video as much as I enjoyed making it, and I do appreciate your time. Thank you very much.